we have been talking about faith. Do you remember that? <laughs> or should I start over? Have we been talking about faith? Yes. Okay. I don't know if it was this or that other church I pastor. <laughs> We've been talking about faith. We started and, and have pretty much uh, stuck to the theme of, uh, not narrowly, but it's always been a big part of what, we're, what I'm preaching up here, is the power of the tongue, uh, the importance of the words of our mouth, saying what God has said, speaking his word in every circumstance every situation. And we've learned along the way, we've learned a little bit about the difference between ownership and possession. What belongs to us because of what God has said and what God has done and what he has made us and what we have manifestly experienced and how faith is how we bring those things into our lives. Things that God says uh, belong to us. And uh, we spent a lot of time looking at uh, recognizing and receiving what God has promised. Because I say this again, uh, God is God, and he can make any demands he wants to. And I just think, uh, I'm so grateful that God has set up the universe the way he has set it up. Let me kind of dance around this a little bit. I was, I was jotting some things down too fast to really get them organized because they weren't strictly in line with where I'm going this morning, which again is a, is a, I'm dragging this out so it's not 10 minutes. I want to make this at least a 12 minute sermon. <laughs> let me put it, let me think about this. When you think about the doctrine of, and I don't know how many of you are familiar, I don't know how much, what your, everybody's background is, but everybody know what purgatory is? The doctrine of purgatory, basically a temporary hell. Uh, it's like you're going to go to heaven, but you're not good enough yet, so you've got to have your sins purged. You've got to suffer the, the, the torment of hell for a limited time uh, to make you holy. Or even uh, salvation in terms of what we must do in order to be worthy of heaven. And while those b doctrines are not biblical, on one level they at least make sense to us, right? Our sense of justice is somehow satisfied uh, by thinking, well, I need to do something to pay. Pay my way, or pay for my sin, or something. Uh, and I hope that we all understand that that is not how God has worked our salvation. But again, they make sense. We, have, we must do something, something to earn our salvation, earn God's favor. But God's plan of salvation is so wonderful, it is so generous and what we have to do in order to receive it is what? Believe and speak. He has already done all the work, right? It's finished. So when we look at the promises that are attached to salvation, and let me drive this, home, this point home for just a few minutes, okay? Bear with me. Because we talked about this at length last week. We looked at, in this case, and you could, you could find reiterations of this promise and different aspects of it throughout the Old Testament and certainly in the New Testament. But we looked at Deuteronomy last week where Moses was, after he had uh, recounted their history, and, and he didn't do this all just in one spot, and we looked at two spots, but where he told them, this is what God's plan is for you. I'm bringing you into this land that I promised Abraham 400 years ago. You're finally all of his descendants that I also promised him all those years ago, here you all are, and you're coming now to inhabit this land that I am giving you. And it's great, and here's why it's great. The land is super productive. There are already people living there, so it's, it, everything has been maintained and cultivated. And you're going to move in, you're going to enjoy it, and as long as you observe the laws that I gave you on the way here, you will never lack anything. You will not be sick. You will not be infertile. You will not be harassed uh, by, by the, the nations that surround you. I'm going to give you peace. I'm gonna, uh, you're going to be a, a, the, the head and not the tail. Blessed here, blessed there. He lists all of these things. And it's so wonderful. But again, it was for who? Who are these promises for? They are for the righteous. 
and then follows it up. Just in case you missed that, if you don't keep my commandments, if you disobey me, if you forget who put you here, you're going to lose these things. You're going to be cursed here, cursed there. You're going to be uh, borrowing instead of uh, lending, and your enemies are going to have ascendancy over you. And this is what we see happening throughout the history of the Old Testament because they didn't keep the law. But this is what's beautiful about the new covenant, the covenant that you and I are in, because those promises, which the New Testament tells us, are what? Yes and amen for those who are in, to those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means that since we are in Christ, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. We are qualified for all of those blessings because Jesus kept the law perfectly and we are in him. You have to understand that that is the only solid basis for your faith when you go to God for anything. I've shared my healing confession with you many times. I'm not going to recite it now. But it, I always start with, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and it is because of the finished work of Jesus and only because of the finished work of Jesus that I believe and I declare that I am healed, head to toe, front to back, side to side, inside and out, and then all the other stuff, right? This is where we start with our prayers. This is what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. It's not a magic phrase that we attach to the end of our prayers. It's acknowledging that it is only through Jesus and in Jesus that we have access to the Father in the first place and that we know that the good things he promises and the good things he wills for us belong to us. All right? <laughs> Just, I, I, I'm, I don't want to fish for those amens, but I do want to make sure we're, we're getting this. We also have to understand that we needed to be qualified by Christ because every one of us was disqualified because of our sin, because of our sin nature, all right? So you read these promises in Deuteronomy, it looks like do this, be blessed, don't do this, be cursed, and the fact is they couldn't do it because of the sin nature. And Christ is the one who changed all that. But even that you know, we read through those promises in Deuteronomy, and they're wonderful. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who what? Forgives all your sins, heals all your diseases, fills your mouth with good things, so your youth is renewed like the eagles. He's talking about an abundant life. Back in Psalms. And people ask then, I've been asked, you have probably been asked, or you may have asked this question, if God is so good and God is so God, why doesn't he just dump those things into my life? If he really wants me to be healthy all the time, why am I not healthy all the time? If he really wants me to be abundantly supplied, why do I ever have any amount of debt? Why does this happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? It's the oldest philosophical problem conundrum of all time, probably, if God is all good and God is all powerful, why is there evil and suffering in the world? Is he God or isn't he? And if he is God, is he good or isn't he? Anybody ever ask you that? Have you wondered that? Well, you know now, I know you know the answer to this, but he really does want these things for us, but the reason we don't always experience them, there's two things that we have not yet been delivered from. We have not been delivered from our flesh, and we have not been delivered from the presence of our enemy. We still live in this world, and so does he. You understand that, don't you? So the promises are still ours, but we must contend for them. And we do that by faith. And we exercise that faith in a, in, in a couple ways, but one super important way, the one we've been talking about, is with the words of our mouth, saying what God says, agreeing with what God says, and speaking it. But we talk, when we talk about contending for things in faith, it's like, look, if I'm convinced, and I am, and I know most of you are, I'm convinced that if I am uh, suffering physically, whether it's a cold or whether it's cancer, I am utterly convinced that's not God's will for me. 
Healing is God's will for me. And so I contend for that healing by saying, God has said, this is mine. In Jesus' name, I will experience the manifestation of that which Christ paid such a dear price for when he took those stripes on his back. And so on. And what do we say when that healing is manifest? When that need is met? We praise God for the victory. We talk about being more than conquerors. We talk about being overcomers. We talk about victory. But here is, some, this emerged, by the way, yesterday briefly during men's prayer. But those of you who've been here long enough, you know this is one of my favorite themes. One of my favorite sayings is, there is no victory without a battle. You can live in peace and safety and happiness and joy and carefree, but that's not the same thing as victory. If you're going to have a victory, you're going to have a fight. And you win, and praise God for the victory. We talk about being conquerors. What are we conquering? What are we overcoming? Open your Bibles to Judges chapter 3. In Judges, uh, we have now come uh, to a, a next, you know, we, we, we read in Deuteronomy, and we know, most of you know, I'm fast forwarding through a lot of this, obviously, but when they entered the land of promise under the leadership of Joshua, Moses' successor, Moses', Moses protege, and they did well. They went into the land, they began to divide it up. This tribe got this, they, they, they set the boundaries for each tribe, and they began, little by little, to inhabit the land that God had given them. And, they, and, and because Joshua was such a good, strong leader, and he spoke such challenging and encouraging words, they followed the Lord faithfully until he died. And then what happened? Then their hearts slowly began to turn. And they got lazy. And they stopped following God so closely. They got too cozy in some cases with the sin that they were surrounded by. And what happened? Exactly what God said would happen. Their enemies would start to creep in and start to take some of that land back or try to. And the people would recognize this is our fault. We sinned. And it turns out that this, this word we have that we've had all these years, turns out it's true. So God, we're sorry. Help us. Save us. And he would raise up a deliverer, which... which uh, this, this, in, in this uh, portion of, hist of the history of Israel, these, these leaders, these deliverers, these warriors uh, were called judges. They weren't judges as in, you know, robes sitting on the bench deciding legal cases. They exercised God's judgment on the enemies of Israel when Israel repented. And then, once the victory was won, this judge would sort of serve as a de facto king. They never called him king. But as long as they had that good, strong leader, they would follow God right? And then that leader would die, and they'd drift away. And uh, there are probably people, a handful of uh, youngins and leaders who came up in my youth group who remember this, this uh, remember SWORD, misspelled SWORD, the acronym with that, with SWORD without a W, S-O-R-D, sin, oppression, repentance, deliverance. Sin, oppression, repentance, deliverance. This became the pattern. As a nation, they would enter into sin, and the sin would bring outside oppression. They'd recognize this is our fault. They would repent, and God would raise up a deliverer. They'd be delivered. They'd ride high for a while and then fall right back into their sin. This is the era that they are entering at the beginning of the book of Judges. And I just want to read two verses here from Judges chapter 3. Judges 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. Isn't that fascinating? That something about staying in fighting trim was important to God. He didn't just leave those enemies there to harass them and mess with them. There was nothing um, petty about this. That's not the word I'm looking for. Nothing capricious about it. God did this for a reason. You need to have challenges. 
You need to learn how to fight because faith is going, you are going to have to contend in faith for everything I want for you until the end of the age. Until you are manifest, until you are out complete, not just redeemed from the power of the enemy, but redeemed from the presence of the enemy, including your flesh. When you're in a glorified body that doesn't want the same things as this body does, and when you're outside, when the enemy has once and for all manifestly been put away from our midst, things will be different. Meanwhile, you got to know how to fight. And I will, if I remember, it's going to be a couple weeks before I'm back in the pulpit, uh, because uh, David is preaching next week, David Gulliford, and you'll want to be here for that because he's going to be talking about this possess, uh, um, ownership and possession and taking the land. And uh, the week after that is Keith Hershey, and so I won't be back in the pulpit, I guess, until three weeks from today, right? But remind me, and I will preach my King Asa sermon. Okay, it's one of my favorites, and since this is sort of like greatest hits uh, month, uh, we'll go back and do that one. But it's just a phenomenal story about a guy who forgot how to fight. And so it's important. And God, uh, God left these enemies in there so that they never forgot how to make war. And listen, the, so this, this should encourage you, on, uh, and it should also challenge you. Just because you find yourself in a battle, you're in the midst of a fight, you're in the midst of a struggle, doesn't mean you're out of the will of God. Also, just because you're in the middle of a battle, in the middle of a fight, doesn't mean you're in the center of the will of God. You see how we can misinterpret that? We can sit there and say, well, the way the devil's been beating up on me, I must be doing exactly what God wants. We should examine ourselves and see if we haven't done something to open up uh, a path for the enemy to come in and mess us up. God will speak to us. It, it doesn't, it's usually not that mysterious, right? But meanwhile, we live in a messed up, fallen world. There's a lot wrong with it. And some of these things that we endure are, uh, I, think, I think we give the devil too much credit. You know, he, he can only, he, he's not infinite. He doesn't have infinite resources. Uh, and some of the, the battles we fight are just, some of them are just a result of living here in this messed up world. But we still have victory over those. If, if there's something that you feel like you've done, what I have, have I done something to open this up? Make it right with God. He's not going to hold it against you. Just acknowledge it and move on. And start speaking the word. Start doing these faith things again. It was never you that earned it in the first place. Okay? Now, again, because of all of this, it's vital that we soak ourselves in the word of God so that we know what is supposed to be ours. And then we put our words to work and speak his words with our mouths. But I'm going to read you a long passage uh, from this hall of faith. We've been looking in Hebrews chapter 11, where Paul opens that chapter by defining faith, and then moves on to give these great examples, and he names all these names, all these faith heroes, which is what we, we call the hall of faith. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 4, and bear with me, because I'm reading all the way through verse 40. Read along, and... It, Read, I hope you brought a Bible and that you can highlight things that I tell you to highlight or that jump off the page. Uh, otherwise, you know, go home and do it later. But we'll start in verse 4, Hebrews eleven four. 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he, being dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Highlight verse 6. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Uh, Noah is my mom's faith hero. That's her, her, favorite, uh, her favorite faith guy uh, in the Bible, probably her favorite guy in the Bible other than Jesus. And how long did it take him to build that ark? 100 years? 120 years? Anybody know for sure? 
120 years. That's faith, isn't it? You keep on with that task for 120 years. I've known people who didn't even live 120 years, let alone spend 120 years on this one particular project. Anyway, a lot of faith wrapped up in his story. Verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And by the way, yeah, well, well, it says right here, he went out not knowing where he was going. And that's true. God told him to get up, leave his family, go to a place that he would show him. Where am I going, Lord? I'll tell you when you get there. Uh, Verse 9, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, this is a verse we looked at a few weeks ago, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Highlight that if you haven't already. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. That was something. This huge, huge promise that that Isaac and Sarah had to believe in their old age and for so long, and it finally comes. Isaac is born, and a few years later, God says, okay, sacrifice him to me. <laughs> and what, start all over now that we're even older? And, 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 but God had already promised him what? No, this seed's going to continue through Isaac. So Abraham had enough faith to believe, if we go through with this, if I end up actually killing my son, God's going to raise him from the dead because I believe his promises. Uh, by faith, Isaac blessed Uh, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Did that a long time before those bones made that journey. Uh, Verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Wow, it's a good thing Moses wasn't born ugly. We might not have had a Moses, right? (laughs) Kidding. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, when they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and of David and Samuel. He's talking, he mentions several judges there and throwing in uh, uh, Samson and Jephthah is a head scratcher if you read their stories. These were some unstable, wild individuals, but they accomplished great things by faith. David and Samuel and the prophets, verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. Woo! Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. 
They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Now, there is a lot to unpack there, but I want to stay on track. I want to stay on point here. I want you to see a couple of important things. And the main thing is this. In this passage, the author of Hebrews, who we all agree is, <laughs> thanks for humoring me. I believe it's Paul, therefore it's Paul. No, don't take that to the bank. But God, through the author of Hebrews, is making, is making some dynamite points here, and he lists all these heroes of the faith. And overwhelmingly, the issue is not about faith for getting, faith for receiving. It's about faith for doing, faith for obeying. Do you see that? By faith, they did this. And they did this by obeying God, but they obeyed some pretty tough commands, pretty tall orders. How were they able to do it? By faith. But the evidence of their faith, their legacy of faith, was not what they received from God. It's what they did for God through his power. In the case of those last few verses, we can see how faith would absolutely be necessary. I don't even want to read that passage again. Continuing to believe in God, refusing deliverance while you're sawn in two. And remember, and boy, this is a cheerful message. You can rebuke sickness, you can rebuke poverty. You can lay hold of every promise of God, and in faith, you can successfully oppose everything that tries to rob you of those promises. But you cannot rebuke persecution. You cannot rebuke the hatred of the world. Jesus himself promised those things. Jesus was so attractive to his followers. And the closer his followers were to him, the more attractive he was. And he shared some things. And he made wonderful promises. He talked about the coming kingdom and made them want it, but then said, before you get any wrong ideas, this world has hated me. You better believe they're going to hate you too. What is it? Now again, let's don't be stupid about this. He does say that we are going to have persecutions in this life. I'm not going to stand on that promise and confess it over myself. You'd have to be have something wrong with you if you wake up saying, you know, I'm just not getting persecuted enough. Lord, you promised me persecution. I speak that into my life. I declare I'm the most persecuted man on the face of the earth. It's going to come. All right? But what enables us to endure? Now, now, also remember, there are people who say, well, they, and they're suffering in, under all sorts of manifestations of the curse of the law that aren't God's will for them. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to carry this disease. I'm going to carry this defect. I'm going to carry this debt. I'm going to carry all these things. No matter what God's word has promised, this is just my way of being persecuted. No, that's not persecution. How do we endure the hard parts, by faith. Here's, now, that's, okay, by faith. Well, that's easy. All right, I got faith, so it's, it's, the hard parts are going to be easy. Let me try to connect some dots here. In Hebrews 11:6, we just read it, but without faith, 
It is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Notice it doesn't say he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek rewards. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Not only that, what is my reward if I'm seeking God? If I'm seeking gold, I don't consider myself rewarded until I have found gold. If I'm seeking athletic success, I'm not, I won't consider myself rewarded until I have that gold medal, or at least a medal, when I've won something. If I'm, uh, if I'm seeking knowledge, knowledge is its own reward. If I'm seeking God, God is my reward. You know, he said that to, to Abraham, I am your shield and your very great reward. Although, he also, depending on the translation you read, that could say, I am your shield and your reward will be very great. Daniel wrote this in chapter 11. Now, Daniel, he was recording words given to him by an angel in a very specific context, but we can still take the challenge and the encouragement from these words. It says, the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Do you want to be strong? Do you want to do something? Even something as big as something that's going to be considered a great exploit? I would kind, kind of like to, when this, when this life's said and done, be able to look back and say, I did that by the power of God. What is the key? How am I going to do that? By knowing God. The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And never forget, because it's right at the center of what we've been talking about, the more we come to know God, the more we understand just how much he desires to bless us, just how much of his character is wrapped up in healing, in provision and protection and all of these wonderful promises that he makes to the righteous. He doesn't say, remember, I'm God and I can heal you whenever I want. I'm God. I am capable of meeting your needs. What does he do? He ties his name to those promises. I am Jehovah Rapha. I'm not just Jehovah who Raphas sometime. I am the God who heals you. I am Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees and provides. That's who I am. Amen, Brother Scott. Preach it. And Romans, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. What shall we say to these things? What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. That's a pretty good God. Praise the worship team. You can be coming up here. And this is where we come unavoidably. Unavoidably. 